Welcome to Espresso with the Evangelist. I'm Dave Caro, the Continuous Delivery Evangelist here at Split, and with me today is Craig. Craig, let's get started with a little toast. Cheers. All right. Mm. All right. Uh, so, uh, Craig, why don't you introduce yourself, and then we'll talk a little bit about why we're going to talk about trunk-based development today. My name is Craig Sabinik. I am a Site Reliability Engineer, or SRE for short, here at Split. Uh, I've been here for about a year, but I've also been at a couple of other startups and at LinkedIn. Right. And you've been through the adventure of moving to trunk-based development more than once. Yes, uh, uh, a couple of times. So we should have plenty to talk about in terms of kind of, um, well, we should probably start with what is it? You know, and our audience is probably a mix of people who've heard of trunk-based dev or who've delved into it a little bit. And, and I think we should do a little definition and then maybe we can dispel some myths about some things and then we'll go from there. So, so I think a lot of people say, hey, trunk-based development is when I'm committing um, all my changes to master. So uh, true-ish, uh, well, let's clarify though, there's really kind of two main flavors that we run into, aren't there? Yes, so there are two main types of trunk development, uh, trunk-based development. And one is, as you mentioned, where you can take all your commits and commit them directly to your main branch in Git uh, nomenclature, this is usually called master. Uh, in other SCM systems, it might be called something else. But whatever your main branch is, uh, which we will refer to as master for the purpose of this conversation, uh, you can commit directly there. The other type that uh, I have seen more common, right. commonly used, is where you actually s commit into a feature branch and then uh, create a PR from that feature branch into the, the main branch, the master branch. The idea is to keep those feature branches relatively right, short. Sure. So often you'll hear short-lived feature branch exactly. as the name, and, and the key is that um, you know, PR is a pull request, that actually creates a dialogue, hey, I believe I'm ready to commit my code or I have a question or whatever, but I'm, I'm having a dialogue with whoever's gonna help me review this. And then you have kind of an audit trail of sorts, which is that I've asked for a review, somebody did review it, this is what they said, we made a minor change, and then we committed it to the master. The PR or pull request process is a way for different developers to collaborate and the nature of the changes, whether the changes are meeting the product feature or whether there are even small semantic changes or like safely style. coded or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. Not enough comments. That whole process is what the PR process helps to surface. Um, that said, there are other ways to accomplish the same goal. One of them that's common is pair programming or sometimes called mob programming, depending on how many people yeah, are involved. Right, right. And that is where that communication happens before the commit. Yeah, you're effectively reviewing as you write it. Exactly. So it's not a separate step. Exactly. Good for speed, theoretically, because there's not a queue of waiting for people to review your code. Right. But a little, a little more dependent on uh, discipline and rigor of the team to self-enforce, whereas with pull requests, you have a bit more of an audit trail, right? Yes, exactly. Right. Right. Also, it usually works in teams that are a little bit smaller. Right. Uh, that isn't always the case, but it is usually uh, larger teams use the PR process of one type or another. Yeah, and I think you know, people have heard the term two pizza team, which, you know, it's about you know, 10 plus or minus a couple of people, people that could be fed by two pizzas. If there's one room of people that all know what we're building this week or today or whatever, then that review process should be pretty crisp. Um, if you're talking about a much larger situation or more interdependencies, then um, it's not likely everybody's gonna be on the same page and so you might need to be a little more formal. But I think the key, the key takeaway here is that in trunk-based development, we're not running really long feature branches which lead to one of the favorite buzzwords here, long feature branches, everyone's got to merge. Well, if it's a long branch, the chances of merge hell are quite high, right? Exactly. The, the stress and hassle and tedium of fixing that merge when you thought you were done, right? And so maybe, maybe we should just back up a stretch and say one of the things about trunk-based development is I'm trying to avoid deferring pain and having a big merge hell later. I want to find small problems fast. So it's a bit like shifting left. Correct. So the idea is that as other people are working on their own features, you want all of those features, all those different branches to kind of coalesce. So the quicker often. that often, <laughs> often yes. exactly, not later. Exactly. <laughs> um, and the hope is that by keeping that time relatively small, that the number of overlapping changes should be zero. Ideally zero, but even if they're not right. zero, if they're small, right. also when it happens relatively soon after you've actually made that code change, 
then it's all in your head about exactly what right. you can change, how to merge those uh, different pieces of code. If it's something that you wrote a month ago, Good luck. It, yeah, it could be very hard figuring out exactly right. what you were thinking and why it's done differently than in the other branch. Well, like a lot of new practices, it's actually intuitive once you look back, which is exactly. like, it, it, it's a bummer to wait six days or even or six weeks to find out you've got a bug or a conflict. But if you find out between, you know, uh, coffee and lunch, um, it's still fresh in your mind and you can probably fix it much faster and you haven't gone on to something else. Exactly. Right, right. cool. Okay, so uh, with trunk-based development, you'll often hear it mentioned kind of in the same sentence or paragraph with things like uh, feature flags, with um, uh, shortening development time, with continuous integration, continuous delivery. So things are all kind of interrelated. And I think as an SRE, one of the issues you face is you've got, we've got different environments. And one of the concepts that in modern software is this notion kind of, of immutable code or sort of I have one version and I don't have all these variants that are hard to keep track of, right? So let's talk a little bit about one of the drivers in, in probably for a couple times in your career here has been this issue of environments versus code branches and such. Yep. So it's common when you have multiple branches to have a branch per environment. Uh, as an example, it, you will have the, the master branch be uh, develop, right? Or development right. or whatever you want to call it. And that's where most developers check into and out from. Uh, and so this is what they usually keep in sync. And then they will branch to off of that master, they will branch into stage and then branch into say production. Uh, again, the names don't really matter. The right, point yeah. is- Higher, lower level environments, right, whatever. We have different exactly, names for these things. Exactly. But yeah. Uh, and the idea is once you've reached a certain point within the main branch, again called develop or dev, then you merge at that point into stage. And then you can decide where along the stage progression you want to merge into production. And the opportunity this gives you is you can continue to make changes in both develop and stage right. at the same time as you find bugs in staging, for example. This is a lot more common when you have very long testing phases, especially if you have manual testing. It may take a while for you to figure out the bug. Exactly. Right. Right. And then you figure out, oh, there are these changes. Meanwhile, develop continues to move forward. At that point, there might be some new piece of code that is directly incompatible with that whatever bug you want to fix in stage. So you, then you have to be able to commit right, directly. So this is the benefit stage. of having the separate branches exactly. in this case, right? Exactly. Right. Um, and then you fix everything, and now we're at a good point. And hopefully, point. we then revert. We merge back so that we we don't create a, re a reversion. Uh, it, 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 it depends right. on exactly what's happened. Right. Yeah. Uh, so right. it is possible that again you have incompatible changes as dev has moved forward and staging has moved forward as well. It is now not possible to merge back without merge help. Yeah. So what I like though, I, as a, I've kind of been looking into this, is is if you're if you're doing trunk dev, it's, it's very common to have, one of the patterns anyway, is this notion of a release branch, which developers can't commit to, right? So a release manager um, is building this release branch, and the goal is to have that stopping in time. You wanna keep moving forward with stuff that's not scheduled for this release on, uh, in the development group, and you're now saying, hey, I think we're ready to do a release, and then maybe as you're doing some testing, you find some issues. And ideally, you fix an issue in, in main or in the master, and cherry pick. You literally just take that change, pull it up to the release branch, right? And again, that's being done by the release manager, not by the developer pushing to the release Correct. branch, right? So what we're doing is we're trying to keep kind of as few separate pieces as possible and to keep it as simple as possible and not some crazy... Uh, right, but one of the things you just highlighted is the fact that there is a different person who is not the developer right. who is now in charge of what things get merged up or uh, what things get ignored, et cetera. That also does not lend itself to continuous deployment all that well. Right. Because you have this other person who is now the kind of gatekeeper on what uh, commits right. from this master which brand. Which means is bottleneck, brand. which means knowledge transfer. Exactly. It's, it's all exactly. the things you're trying to avoid by. So if you right. want to get to AWS's level, for example, where they deploy you know, every second, right. then that is almost impossible to do if you have a right. human being in that chain. But it's fair to say that, that we run into people who are trying to move from sort of quarterly releases to monthly releases to bi-weekly releases to daily releases. <laughs> and even at the cadence of a daily release, you could probably have a release manager. But as you're, as you're saying, there's no way with 
every second releases right. that there's a release manager because that's what automation's for. Um, right. So yeah, I think I think. But the key things for so, let's say if somebody is is watching this series and and they're so like, what is Trunk Dev and how is that relevant? You know, I think if we look at the key points here, we're we're trying to uh, reduce, if not eliminate, the deferred pain of problems that that are found much after they're created. We want to, we actually, we're okay with creating problems. We just want to find them quickly. Correct. Right? Shift left. Right, that's the shift left thing. Um, and we want to be really clear about um, what is where and, uh, you know, how can I simplify and yet be doing, moving faster, right? Uh, some people are probably wondering why you'll often see mentions of trunk-based development and feature flags in the same sentence or the same paragraph. It seems like we kind of live in similar spaces, right? So why is that? So one of the problems you find is if all these feature branches are checking into a single branch, this master branch, there will be changes that you do want to test against all the other changes, right? So all these feature branches, you want all merged together and evaluate them against each other, but you may not want those changes actually exposed to customers yet. Right, all the way to, to and it's funny, I was gonna say all the way to production, but actually I had to stop myself because you may want it to go all the way to production, but right. you don't want to expose it in production to an actual customer. Maybe you want it just for the development team or for right. testers and the like. Exactly, and so you might want to be able to expose this code to the volume of traffic without having people actually be able to use that code. There are potentially two different ways of handling this. Anyway, what you want to be able to do is you want to have that code deployed to production, but in some kind of controlled manner, and that's right. where feature flags really come. Right, and I think some, the really simple case I'll often talk about is if I'm committing at least once a day, and it's gonna take me a few days to finish my work, I need, to, I need to wrap that work in a feature flag so that it's dark, so that it's off, um, in order to not risk it going into a testing environment that it, or a production environment it shouldn't be in yet, right? Right. So, so there's A, there's the, it's just not anywhere near finished yet, but I'm trying to keep, I'm committing often so that others will see my changes. Um, uh, uh, I don't want to go live. And then there's the issue, which is, well, we're working on a number of these features. We don't really plan to expose them to customers and say until maybe a, a public release or an event or something, but I want to be able to test them and make sure they all work together. I don't want to find out whether my features play nice together at the opening keynote of my developer conference. Right. right? That's the wrong time to figure out whether they work exactly. well, even though I don't want the public to know about them yet. Right. right. So feature flags. And you also have uh, environmental issues. So as you commit all this code, there might be other dependencies that are completely outside of your code. So for example, you need another database or you need another cache. Mm -hmm. uh, there are things like that that might be missing in production, but might exist in your test environment. So being able to have your new code behind a feature flag, such as it's only exposed to a limited set of people, means that only that small set of people will see that error that the database doesn't exist or the cache doesn't exist. So feature flags also allow you to, the ability to um, test environmental differences between your yeah, uh, and, staging and, 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 and likewise, if this notion of one of the things you'll also see, again, if you kind of look into this, is branch by abstraction. So this idea that, that I've, and it, let's say I'm moving from one system to another, or I'm, 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 I'm trying to deconstruct a monolith. Um, one of the handy tools to use is, is abstraction, where you know today I'm using this database, and I want to go to using that database. And instead of the direct calls to the database, I put an abstraction layer here. And then the app is calling the abstraction layer, and I can do what I want down here whenever I want, right? And the, it shouldn't affect what's upstream, right? And then over time, I might only move part of my app to hit this one instead of that one. And I can kind of write, and feature flags let you be very nimble about how that happens. It, it, it gets back to that immutable code idea, which is I've got one version of code right. and I'm testing the one version of code, but I wanna be able to make some changes in environments or for a limited number of users um, without having to have separate versions of my code. Right. So uh, one of the issues if you're going to uh, trunk-based, instead of sort of having a branch for every environment, um, is this metadata issue which is, you know, if I have these different environments, then I'm, I have commits and merges and such that have metadata. I know exactly what's where and, and which branches and tells me it's, it's, it's in staging, whatever. When I have trunk-based development, I'm, I'm, I've got kind of one copy of everything. So I think you were saying, uh, we had a conversation about this the other day. The issue is, well, you need some place to track that metadata and then you need some way of sort of enforcing workflow. You need a source of truth for what should be deployed in each environment 
and moving it out of SCM. Out of your SCM means you have to put it somewhere. Right, now let's talk. Let, and there are lots of options. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about hot fixes. Mm -hmm. So um, how, do, how do hot fixes change in, in a trunk-based development world? One of the concerns is if you have a frequent deployment, a frequent commit into master, but an infrequent, relatively speaking, uh, deployment into production, master is now drifted uh, yeah, you're, farther this is from- what, uh, This is called accumulating inventory, right? right you basically exactly. have an inventory of changes yes. that, that aren't in production yet, yeah. and so now you've got, right, okay. And if you have a critical customer issue, uh, it is possible that you want to fix this a lot faster than you want to actually deploy all of these changes. Right. So you have one small thing that you want to change. When you have different branches for each environment, this becomes relatively simple. You can either cherry pick the commit from your develop branch into production, or you make a commit directly into production and then deploy that. Now that everything's a master, that might not be an option. So what I've done in the past is had a dedicated hotfix branch. And most of the time, it just lays idle. Once you need it, you now sync it to the commit that's actually deployed in master, not your current head of right. master. The thing, the, I pushed, commit, the thing I already pushed to production. Right, okay. and hopefully you have that metadata stored somewhere. Right. And now you can make whatever single commit or small set of commits on that hotfix branch and then deploy that hotfix, hotfix branch so out this, of production. Tell me, this is a lot like as if, as if you had had a release branch. Like if you had yep. basically spawned a release branch when you made that release, you, you're patching, you're, you're sorry, you're, 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 you're hot fixing against that branch. Correct. In this case, you're logically doing it, which is that yes. you know where you cut the release that right. went to production. You're, you're, you're doing a branch off that into this. You're, right. you're basically taking that up to your hot fix branch, applying the fix and deploying that. Where it gets a little interesting is now what do you do with the fix? With, you know, how do you, mer you have to merge that fix back down into Not your master. Not necessarily, right? Maybe. This is this is where things get complicated. It depends on the delta between what's deployed in production and head of master. It is possible that fix has already been fixed in one of those commits. Or you made just, obsolete, or that, right, that, that exactly. module's gone or something, exactly. right? Yeah. The big right. difference between uh, the re release branch model and the hotfix model is you only use the hotfix branch when it's necessary. And the goal is to keep this delta between production and head of master small. Right. As you decrease that delta between production and what's currently in master, the odds of you using the hotfix branch essentially go to zero. Yeah, and I think that that's a pattern we'll see repeat over and over again, which is that you know, less inventory means less. Right. This is the little shift left thing again, right? right. So, so we're not all going to get to being able to push multiple times a day overnight, but but as you narrow that window, then a lot of things just get a lot easier. Right. People think it's going to be harder because you're going faster, but actually. The inverse is true. The faster you go and the smaller the changes are between, right. everything gets easier, right. right? Which is the sort of journey people are on as they embark on things like trunk-based right. uh, development and using feature flags to, to be able to be more nimble and uh, maybe even using feature flags to conduct experiments. So these things are all interrelated. I wanna thank you for spending a little time with us to talk about trunk-based development. Absolutely. I think that um, it's a fascinating topic. Um, you know, there, you can go a lot of different directions, but I think hopefully people have a better idea of what, what is this and how does this relate really to better software delivery, right? So I'm going to pass your, your cut back awesome. to you and let's uh, say cheers, cheers and end another episode of Espresso with Evangelist. Thanks. Goodbye, everybody.